Today, we're chatting with Vineet Bhatia, one of the very first Indian chefs to have received a Michelin star for the restaurant in London whose kitchen he helmed way back in 2001. Ever since then, he's had many more stars and restaurants to his name. His culinary brilliance has been acknowledged by critics and customers alike. In fact, whether he's cooking in the Arctic or the Antarctic, for the Queen of England at her jubilee, or cooking off with Karan Johar at the colourful IFA Awards, his passion and panache are perfectly in place. He's been on various shows, authored several books, cooked for the world's top names, and been appointed culinary ambassador for Great Britain. We have him with us here today talking about leading the progressive Indian cooking revolution and literally putting Indian food on the map. So uh, now everyone's talking about progressive Indian. You've been doing it for a while. So, you know, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you define progressive Indian? For me, uh, Indian food is very rich, very steeped in stories, heritage, culture, and history basically you know that is something which is a strong foundation and when you have a very strong foundation all you have to do is build on it you know people change times change the eating habits change and trends change you have to basically be uh, something out of the box and something unique if you want to shine if everybody starts making the same butter chicken mas- uh, tikka masala or the tandoori chicken you know that's going to be box and everywhere nothing wrong with the food you know everybody enjoys it and so do i but what makes people come to your restaurant? What is your USP? And this is what I learned at the very early stage that you have to have something which is cutting edge or different from the pack. And that also stems from my background as a child who was probably the shortest in the class and the youngest in the class and who always got bullied and picked up by others and put down. So I know I learned to fight back in a different manner which was staying to myself and doing things which I felt comfortable or best with. So when I actually walked into the kitchen and I didn't want to become a chef as a professor, I wanted to be a pilot. And because I couldn't get through to be a pilot, I was put in the kitchen at the Obrois purely by error. And I said, you're too short to work in a bar or a restaurant, so the only place you can go is the kitchen. And when I walked in the kitchen way back in um, 85, 86, I was quite shocked to see a kitchen run so immaculately, so much of discipline, and I fell in love with it. And I said, I want to learn to cook. So as a young trainee from college at 17, 18, I was doing my two months of internship, seven days a week, 16, 17 hours a day as a kid because I wanted to learn. I was selfish. I was greedy for knowledge. And that is what helped me throughout. So I knew at an early age that if I have to do something different, I need to be a bit different and I need to see food differently. And I also realized at that stage that when mom cooks at home, it doesn't have so many masalas or spices and oil. Unfortunately, when you go to hotel and restaurants, it is quite heavy on those fats and the masalas and the oils and everything almost tastes the same. And I want to clear that off. So I started, when I went to UK especially, I started doing things which were very classic but in a very light manner. And a lot of the people in those days were so used to eating at the curry houses, they never understood Indian cuisine at all. And I was told of saying, oh, this is a five-star cuisine, it'll never work in Europe or in London. And this guy is a fiasco, he's not going to work. But I stuck to my grounds and fortunately we have the top newspapers from the country who gave us excellent reviews as a restaurant. So that was a big boost which comes to you and says, yes, you can. So, you know, instead of calling a, a Nandi Rogan Josh on the menu as a Nandi Rogan Josh, because they took a Rogan Josh had a very different kind of a connotation in that time, which had capsicum, onion and tomato chunks with oil. That got nothing to do with Rogan Josh. So I would call it a slow cooked leg of lamb, cooked with North Indian spices and stuff like those. So a butter chicken became literally chicken tikka morsels into a, a creamy tomato sauce sent with kasuri with it, for example. And because that was not really what they were used to having, but they, they enjoyed the taste, we got away. Now, subsequently, what also happened was instead of putting the food into a bowl and making it look like a brown stew or a red stew, we started putting it into various kinds of uh, service ware and making it look interesting. Now, that was the precursor for, I think, for what we call as your modern progressive cuisine because nobody was doing it in those days, in 92, 93. And I think we were the first people to start putting food on the plate, trying to make it look beautiful. And that then snowballed into actually putting food into various kinds of uh, tasting menus or set up into courses, which was again never done before. So, you know, the first courses we did was like a five course meal. And everybody says, how can you have a five course Indian meal? But if you structure the meal correctly, there's enough protein, there's enough starch, there's enough carbs, 
and vegetables to complete the entire meal and still feel light. So the food was very refined, and that has now somehow has now triggered off and become like a progressive Indian evolved cuisine where everybody is on the bandwagon and now trying to make sure that they also can do it. So you know, I mean, we Sangeet had said a while back that you were in some ways the father of modern progressive cuisine as such. And if you look back and say, probably we were the very first few people to do. I don't know if I was the first person or not. But probably one of the first few guys around the world who ever looked at Indian food in a new avatar. But what has happened is that it has changed the dynamics of Indian cuisine around the world. So you can go into any big mega city around the world, and you will have restaurants now which are doing food which looks beautiful, and it looks nice. And I do find that very satisfying. Uh, it's also very flattering because in many restaurants you go around the world, you find some of your own staff who have been. Through your kitchens in the past and gone, and you work somewhere else, and they take that ethos with them. So, it very much is what something which I learned at the Obroys from Mr. Obroy was in my DNA. These people have learned from my kitchens and moved on and taken it further. So, you know, I always say that when you look at the senior chefs in our industry, and that I mean people like Imtiaz Qureshi, Satish Arora, Manjit Singh Gill, and the likes. You know, these these are fantastic chefs. What took them probably 30 to 30, 40 years to achieve what they did, it probably took us say 20 years. We got it faster with the advent of uh, the internet. And if you look at things now, you know, they will probably get it in five years. But that is life. Things will progress, but at least it's in the right direction. But what we have never ever forgotten is our roots, our authentic flavors, the way the food should taste. And I always say that uh, people say, "Oh, but your food looks very Western." And I said yes, but I said when you eat with your eyes closed, it's India on your palate, and that is important for me. I mean, if you simple example is the IPL is going on, cricket played 30, 35 years back in India, we were nowhere till Kapil Dev won the World Cup, and you look at it now, we've got one of the best in the world. You look at our music industry, you look at our fashion industry, we have accepted the Western into our own and made it our own. I have done exactly the same. I have taken the the best of both the worlds. And put them together. So my food does look glamorous. It does look beautiful. It's very well constructed. It's pleasing for your senses. But most importantly, it's still very Indian. Thanks. Thanks. But, uh, I also wanted to ask you what next now, because you've been doing this for a while. The rest of Indian has progressed, and you know, <laughs> so so what now? You know, I mean, if you have to innovate, if you have, have to do something different, or lead the you know crowd to something. I mean, if you all looking at new ideas and new concepts all the time, I think uh, media is extremely important. So we did do our, our travel shows, twist of days. We did the Netflix show, the final table. We did the Master Chef India. That all went well. What we did last year was we launched our online with the BBC, called the BBC Master, where we actually have online tutorials of how to cook Indian food for people at home. And this is a very detailed 14 hours course. It's about 30 lessons, so you know a simple thing like a biryani is one hour, ten minutes, but it is extremely detailed in your cuts of meat, in your rice. So it's very much informative. I think as a chef, as you grow, you want to give back to the normal audience. You want to teach them. So as in many ways, like a mentor, you're actually teaching people around the world in various forms. So either could be through your Instagram page or through your Facebook or through an online course. We try and teach them techniques. We try and teach them dishes. We try and tell them stories about the food in our own food way of how you can take the food and make it fine. Uh, also, as a, as an Indian chef and uh, being living in the UK for many many years now, almost thirty odd years, I'm also the culinary ambassador for the UK government. So I do events for UK government worldwide, not just in UK. So you're always busy. You have a very vibrant Instagram account. You're uh, everywhere. I would say. I mean, sometimes you're doing Everest base camp uh, experiences. Sometimes you're sky dining in Qatar, or you're doing something in the Antarctic. I mean, it's it's uh, exciting to just follow your journey. But tell me where you get the energy from, and you know the creativity flow from. What's your you know inspiration? Well, I I am actually extremely blessed. I have a very good team behind me. You know, the biggest team behind me is my wife Rashima, who basically gives me the kick every day to get out and perform and do well. So that is the biggest kind of motivation I get. But I think as as a chef and as a person, uh, you want to celebrate life. You want to go out 
and enjoy you know and i am one of very few people probably who is blessed in many ways that i enjoy what i do is to cook so the stress of the accounting and the bookkeeping and the marketing is not my forte so i leave it that to her and to her team i basically do what i enjoy most is to cook and to look after guests because i always feel that the biggest smile which comes from the guest are the biggest accolades you can ever get and that brings happiness to me you know it always does and i look at people i look people ask me oh, what inspires you and i think everything about life inspires me i look at billboards i look at uh, road signs i look at uh, the sand dunes i look at the colors i look at the sky i look at my fridge in the in my kitchen and i look at my staff and i say okay let's cook let's have fun and as long as long as you have fun on a daily basis in what you do it always comes out but the most important thing is that passion that love which you have for your profession in any profession it may be if that can come to you you will always do so i think life inspires me in everything i do and everything i put onto my plates i mean i'm talking of adventures uh, we did the antarctica we did the base camp 3 4 years back and in june we actually go to the arctic so we're doing a two week in the arctic so this time we'll do the polar bears so right from the highest point in the world to the southernmost point of the world and now we go to the northernmost point of the world uh, what comes after that i also don't know i mean there are a few projects in the pipeline but uh, they need to be signed and dusted before we announce it so hopefully that will also come through in the next few months but exciting times for sure Uh, would you like to share a little bit about your, uh, you know, the TV? You mentioned, of course, Master Chef India and the Family Table and what's coming next. So, you know, what's it been like? I mean, obviously, it's very different having a kitchen and then suddenly being on camera and uh, you know, mentoring people. So, how how does it work? Can we have? It it is it's all based on strong foundations, Priya. You know, once you are into a, a field which you enjoy and uh, your foundations are so strong, things come to you very naturally. So, when we did uh, the twist of taste. basically about 2009 and 10 and 11 it was all traveling with it india trying to see the things and my first thing i told the production team and the channel was uh, i don't want to do a show which puts people down i want to celebrate india i don't want to be showing snake charmers and elephants and cows on the road i want to show the homes of india how they cook in the homes and how they eat on the streets and not luxury hotels so everything was done literally taking from people's home and the roadside and giving that respect and love which they really deserve and celebrate them and celebrate the flavors of india that's what we did that did go well and subsequently we went on to the final table the final table the tv was judging at a very high international platform so i represented india out of the nine chefs so i was the indian chef to represent india and you showcase or you judge people who are not really indians but they're trying to do flavors of india and you guide them in certain ways so that judging was quite a detailed and these are professional chefs these were not housewives or domestic cooks these were literally professional chefs from uh, star restaurants you can imagine so to judge them is again you wear a different kind of a chef's hat but when it comes to masters of india you have a different audience all together because this is for the masses this is for people who were at home the uh, <coughs> sorry the passionate cooks who do their love at home but not professional somebody who is a housewife or somebody who is a banker or an engineer who wants to do about food food and basically try and teach them so although you are judging them we would also mentor them indirectly in many ways through our judgments through our comments through our positive feedback we would give them and try and make sure that everybody is on the progress but what that translate onto the audience for the viewers is information and i love to share the information so for me it was all about sharing information and master chef to the larger audience of how can you make a change in your normal eating how can you make it look more beautiful how can you make it more interesting still keeping your authenticity very much intact and that is very important for me and although we talk of authenticity there's so much happening within india within northwest east and uh, south that everything comes like a jugalbandi it blends quite well we don't need to look outside india for inspiration when we have so much within our india all the techniques done by the japanese by the french the swiss the italians the american are also being done here but to utilize what we have in the india and celebrate that and i think india has so much to offer within its own boundaries and which can then go on around the world you know if you uh, look at the service being done uh, india is on the top 4 cuisines in the world right now in terms of uh, excitement so people want to try and eat and i, I said that long time back during my netflix interview that uh, indian food is a sleeping giant 
is going to break open and just shine you know it, it takes time it does take time but the moment is happening right now you know we are in the cusp of it we are going through it right now and i i see that demand happening worldwide with indian food because we get asked all the time to come into restaurants or you come into gourmet summits or do ambassador roles for them and do a, a talk of them so we see that thing happening but you know you need a more of me who can do that i'm a single person but if you have like 10 12 and there are chefs out there who are now on the it touch level performing extremely well so i only see positive growth now when bbc comes to you and says you want to do an online course you know you jump at it because that's again a very professional setup and you you are doing it for an audience who are quite serious in their approach of life and they expect uh, the true product the bbc is known for its fairness so when that came up we went through the whole process of doing indian cuisine the classic cuisine but doing it nicely presenting it nicely which we always believed in and that is what we did so the entire showcase was that was to teach so if, if somebody buys our books or he goes to the online or he goes to our social media channels to have a look what he will get is a treasure bank of information which then they can use in their own daily lives or in the restaurant it happens all the time So, uh, I mean, since you mentioned that there are a lot of uh, chefs who are doing uh, different things these days, even within India, so it's the fact. I mean, I, I see a lot of young chefs who are doing a lot of, you know, extreme, uh, like detailed research into, uh, you know, the provenance of food or uh, you know, different ingredients which weren't used before. So, you know, for example, like there's somebody who's uh, exploring using mangroves as, uh, you know, to salt. add salt to food without actually adding salt because that was something that housewives way back at some point used so you know things like that i mean now those are things which are coming to the fore within india so how much in touch with that are you i mean you know obviously because you are the forefront internationally but do you come back to the you know to various cities in india and do a little research of your own on every visit or how does it work for you unfortunately i can't I mean, I'm not being able to travel. I mean, the last two years, two and a half years with COVID, everything was stuck, so nobody could travel there. Prior to that, I used to travel within India wherever I could. I haven't done that for a while. So, no, <coughs> sorry. Once things do get back on track, that is something which we always said. Uh, we always have people on the ground who always keep feeding us information through our restaurants and keep telling us. You know, I mean, we did the. I don't know if you know this. We did the five, six years back with, with the Kolkata chicken, which is a black chicken. from yeah. Maharashtra and we had them on our menus you know it, it is an acquired taste but it's a very healthy bird uh, it is still very underrated but i just think uh, because of the low supply it hasn't really come to the forefront so they they are products you know you go down to puducherry and you get some wonderful chocolate for example and that is quite nice you know and you go down to kerala and you get some wonderful cashews and you can do a lot i mean doesn't have to go into cashew into a korma gravy but you can actually do a butter out of it you can actually do a health drink out of it you know it's a great alternative for daily dairy products or good if you products it really works so all this has always been in the forefront now people talk of superfoods and organic grains and stuff like those but you know we have been using uh, jowar bajra and bragi from gornos donkeys of years in a restaurant and we never showcased it we used to do going back years was a ragi dosa for example which i remember seeing made in bangalore in one of the restaurants and i said wow this is brilliant why can't we use that you know uh, one of my favorite vegetables use a beetroot you can love the color but it's also very good for your body and you do tikki you do galotti you do kebab you do korma you do sauces you do beef dishes you do dessert anything you can do with them you know all these things have always been there but we never showcase it as a, a forefront onto a menu it's always been part of our dishes i think uh, maybe we didn't market it in that way we kept it very understated but we always had them you know I mean, haldi now suddenly become a superfood around the world. And even have been using for centuries and centuries and centuries. I mean, mom used to make the haldi wala dood, and we used to all have it to recover. And then you have Starbucks coming and saying uh, turmeric latte, and it suddenly become a sensation around the world. The credit goes to our old grandmothers and uh, dadi, nani, and godu who all have been doing it for so many years. 